Hey students, so uh, making this video to help out for biology with some ideas that come up with evolution. Um, one of the common questions is how old is the earth and how do we know? And so I'm gonna show you a little bit of the evidence that we have um, that helps us conclude how old the earth is. Um, and so this could be useful for an earth science class. This could be useful for chemistry or physics with uh, radioactive decay radioactive dating and for biology this is just so that you guys can see some of the evidence and um, that you can have some confidence in the age of the earth that scientists agree on currently and so with this uh, slideshow hopefully I can get through this in about 20 minutes and um, feel free to send me any questions if you have any so how old is the earth and uh, to get us going, I'm going to share a little bit of history for this. So what some people thought in the past, and then some of the equations that we get from radioactive decay, explain what an isochron is and what the assumptions are that go into doing radioactive dating. And then we'll look a little bit more in depth at the uranium thorium lead systems that are actually used to do radioactive dating for rocks on Earth and also some meteorites from space. And we'll look briefly at other geochronometers that are used. And one of those in particular is actually used for most meteorites from space, as opposed to uranium, thorium, and lead. And from all of that information, we'll be able to come up with a good idea for how old the Earth actually is. And so uh, brief history, layers of rock, strata, with fossilized remains of unknown creatures implied in old Earth. Um, Nicholas Stenio in the 1650s came up with the law of superposition and original horizon horizontality. The law of superposition is the idea is that as sediments get laid down, older sediments are lower or deeper in the earth, newer or younger sediment sediments get layered on top of those. And that all of those sediments are deposited horizontally originally. Uh, there are some deviations from perfect horizontality. Sand dunes in particular can be deposited up to 15 degree angles. Um, any shifts from that, any shifts from that horizontal deposition or that 15 degree angle for sand dunes would have come later from things like tectonic uh, plates shifting, uh, mountains forming, uh, canyons forming, stuff like that. Uh, William Smith in the 1790s looked at strata of rocks around the world and saw that they had similar fossils. And from that, he concluded that those uh, similar strata must have been around the same age that those similar fossils were the same age. John Phillips in 1860 uh, said that the earth was about 96 million years old, just simply based on sedimentary rocks um, and the how much sediment was in the Ganges River in India. And he wrote about this to William Thompson, who's also known as Lord Kelvin. And William Thompson in 1862 said, okay, if the earth formed and was molten originally, how long did it take to cool? And he said that the earth would have taken between 20 and 400 million years to cool, just simply based off of what we know about the rates at which hot bodies cool. Uh, Darwin's theory of evolution from 1859 uh, said that evolution occurred due to random variation with natural selection. And for that to have taken place, for evolution to have produced the variety of species that we could see then, then it would have needed significantly more than 100 million years, if that was true. Um, Thompson, uh, aka Lord Kelvin, also Helmholtz and Newcomb looked at the sun and said just if the sun was gravitationally contracting and reaching the temperatures that it was, how long uh, would the earth have been based off that and that the sun was 20 or 22 or 18 million years old, uh, just based off of gravitational contraction. They didn't know anything about the nuclear reactions that power the sun. George Darwin, who was the son of Charles Darwin, Charles Darwin is the one with the theory of evolution. George Darwin looked at um, the earth and the moon and said that if the moon broke off when the earth was molten, then it would have taken the moon about 56 million years for the tides to have slowed the earth spin down to give it a 24 hour day. John Perry in 1895, was the first one to realize or think about the convection of the mantle and that earth itself had a thin crust on the edge and for that um, 
the information with the mantle causing convection and transfer of heat, it would have taken the Earth about two to three billion years to cool off to uh, the temperature it is now at the surface. John Jolly in 1900 looked at salt accumulation in the oceans from erosion and said it would have taken at least 100 million years for the oceans to have become as salty as they are. And then in 1896, there was the discovery of radioactivity. 1903, Marie Curie separated radium and radium was self-heating. Its radioactive decay was actually able to heat its, itself up. And now we have an explanation that pushes the age of the earth past that two to three billion year range where there must be radioactive material in the center of the earth and that radioactive material is continuously generating heat. And so how does that work? Well, when things decay, often we might call them apparent. And so that's shown by the blue line on this graph. And the thing that the parent decays into is called a daughter. And so if you have a single parent that's radioactive and a single daughter that is stable, then the parent, the amount of parent remaining will decline over time and the amount of daughter will increase over time. You have more of the material decaying when more of it is present. So the parent changes the most when the material is new or young and so does the daughter and the parent and the daughter change the least when the material is older. And we're not going to get into any of the math. We're not going to use these equations in a biology class, but these are the equations that mathematically describe the amount of parent left and the amount of daughter that's present after some amount of time. And for anything that's radioactive, we can figure out what these things called decay constants are, and we can figure out how much should be around after some specific time. These equations change a little bit if there's some daughter present initially. So if let's say uranium decays into lead, then if there's some lead around to begin with, then we can modify that equation based on how much lead was around. And of course we can solve those equations to solve for time. Solving for time would mean that we're actually solving for the age of the material. Sometimes we talk about parent um, or N to represent the parent, sometimes D to represent the daughter, instead of these N1s and N2s that you can see in some of these equations. And in the long run, what this means is that if you have a material, if you have a rock and it forms and it contains some radioactive material, you can look at the amount of the parent present and you can look at the amount of the daughter present. And if you have a collection of rocks that were all formed at the same time, and you measure the number of daughter atoms and the number of parent atoms in those rocks, then you can plot what's called an isochron. And an isochron will give you a straight line. The slope of that line will be related to the age of the material. So you see that e to the lambda t in the equation for the slope, t would be the age, and the lambda is the decay constant of the parent that's radioactive. And so you can also measure these relative to some sort of an internal standard. As long as those materials were all co-genetic created at the same time and place, they will give you the same straight line. Even if they're different minerals, different minerals might incorporate different amounts of the parent atoms, which would mean that over time, it would also have different amounts of the daughter atoms. Um, with all of these equations though, there are some assumptions that go into this. And there's also assumptions that go into analyzing these rock samples when we're trying to figure out how old they are. The first assumption is that the sample has not gained or lost parent or daughter atoms except by decay of parent to the stable daughter. This will not always unfortunately be true and we need to be able to recognize samples for which it's not true so that we know how to um, work around this assumption. The second assumption is that the decay constant of the parent is independent of time and is not affected by physical conditions and is known accurately. We do know for uranium, for uranium-235, uranium-234, uranium-238, we do know very accurately what their decay constants are. And there's only one type of radioactive decay called electron capture, which is affected by physical conditions. And we don't use electron capture decays for any of this dating stuff. So the type of decay that uranium goes through, which is mostly an alpha decay, but there's a chain of decays and some of those other decays are called beta decays. All of those decays 
all of those decay constants are known very accurately and those decay constants do not change based on physical conditions. The third assumption is that an appropriate value of N2 naught is used. This would be the original amount of daughter present. Again, we can figure this out in some cases from the isochrons, but if the isochron is not a perfectly straight line, then you may have to make a, a good guess about what the original amount of daughter would have been. The measured values, the fourth assumption is that the measured values of the daughter and the parent are accurate and representative. Accurate means that we're actually measuring how much is there. Representative means that we're not just measuring how much is on the surface, but that we're actually measuring how much is uh, present throughout the whole material. And that the surface hasn't uh, changed in some way in which the center of the material has not. So these four assumptions are the foundation of radio dating. Um, they can get tricky sometimes when we apply them. So as an example, rubidium 87 is radioactive and that will decay into strontium 87. Strontium 86 is stable and we can use that as what's called an internal standard. So we can look at how much rubidium is present compared to how much strontium is present and depending on the type of mineral, you might have more or less rubidium than strontium. And over time, as the rubidium decays, you would form more strontium-87. The first assumption that nothing has affected how much material is there doesn't always work if the rock has melted again and reformed. So anytime you melt a rock completely, and recool it and reform that rock, this is almost like resetting the timer. And so when you melt a rock and you reset that timer, you can only date that rock back to the last time it was completely melted and was able to completely cool. There are um, things you can do to look at rocks that have been disturbed and we'll get a, into a couple of those examples later on. But basically every time a rock completely melts, this resets the timer. You can't figure out anything about its history prior to that last complete melt. Um, this has an effect when we look at uh, minerals that come from a source of heat. So, and the different minerals may have different melting points. And so there is a um, gabbro in Minnesota, the Duluth gabbro, this is close to what was an igneous intrusion. So molten rock, molten magma came up through layers of the earth, layers of rock, and that spread heat out through the rest of the rock that was around it. Different minerals have different melting points and the minerals that were closer and to the igneous intrusion melted more than minerals that were further away and minerals that were closer that had lower melting points were also more likely to melt and change in some way and have their clocks reset. And so the graph here of potassium argon dates, this is a different chronometer, looking at the dates that you get from that radioactive decay chain or radioactive decay system, you can see that different minerals would give you different ages. So if you looked at a distance of one kilometer away, from the igneous intrusion, the potassium feldspar would have looked like it was about 1 billion years old. The biotite would have looked like it was about 1 billion years old. The muscovite would have looked like it was a little more than a billion years old, but the hornblende would have still looked like it was about maybe say two and a half billion years old because the hornblende has a higher melting point. Muscovite is a little bit lower, biotite is even lower, and feldspar here has the lowest melting point. The further away the distance, the further away you go from the igneous intrusion, the less of that material would have melted, and so more of that material will have retained the parent and the daughter that you're trying to measure. And so you can see these ages actually increase for the biotite the further away you get from the igneous intrusion. And it's not that these are older or younger necessarily. All of this biotite would have been formed at about the same time, but some of this biotite seems like it's younger because it lost material that we can't count, that we can't detect that's in those samples. And so metamorphic events 
can have an impact on our dating of materials. If you lose the daughter, then it's going to look like a younger sample. So if you're losing not the parent that's radioactive, but the thing that it decays to, it's going to look like it's a younger sample. If you lose the parent, then it's going to make it look like an older sample. So here's the uranium lead system and thorium is included in here. We know these decay constants very accurately. Um, and we know what these decay chains decay to. Uranium mostly decays to lead. One of those decays to bismuth, okay? The thorium also decays to a lead isotope. And so we can look at the parent and the daughter and figure out how old these materials are. Here is some examples with uranium and lead. And so here is a system with where we're looking at different amounts of th thorium and lead, uranium and lead, and then even two different isotopes of lead to help us uh, look at kind of fake look at, pseudo look at a different uranium. And we can see that the lead and the thorium look good, the lead and the lead look good. They both give us an age of about 2.75 to 2.8 billion years old. These straight lines are the isochrons, okay? But when we look at this uranium lead plot, we see that we don't get a really good straight line. We see that what looks like has happened is that we've lost uranium. That would give us a steeper isochron here, which would actually make this appear to be an older sample than it really is. Um, it's gonna make it seem like the, the parent has turned into more of the daughter than it really has, and that more, even more time has passed. And so notice that we don't get a straight line here. So that's an indication that this sample was disturbed. Um, scientists also uh, started looking at moon rocks in the 1960s and 70s, and they were trying to date those moon rocks. And rather than using the isochrons, like with the uranium lead system, they explored some other equations, some other mathematical relationships that would allow them to get a little bit more information out from the materials. And so here's something called a concordia. And you can do something like you do with the isochrons where you plot different ratios on these two axes. Here we're looking at uranium-238 and lead-206, uranium-235 and lead-207. And over time, you would move along this curve at the top as long as there's no um, disturbance of that rock of that material. But if there's a disturbance, then you're gonna change what those ratios are between the uranium and the lead and the uranium-238 and the lead-206 and the uranium-235 and the lead-207. And if you lose some lead here, then you will move along these points here on this Discordia A. So what Discordia A would show you if you were looking at Discordia A right now at this moment in time, it would show you that the material was two and a half billion years old overall, but that it had just been disturbed because that time here would be zero, okay? If you let that sit for some time though, then all of these points along Discordia A will move along curves just like that curve shown at the top and if you came back sometime later and plotted your points here along Discordia B, what you get from Discordia B is that the sample overall is three and a half billion years old, but that it was disturbed about one billion years ago. And so this gives you a little bit more information. So maybe we didn't lose all of the material, maybe it didn't completely melt. We can still use this to get some information out. This would not give us a nice straight line for an isochron but when we use a Concordia, we can get that information. And there's different types of Concordia. You would get something similar from this. It intersects up here at 3.2 billion years old, and there's an intersection down here 200 million years ago. So the conclusion from this graph would be that this sample was 3.2 billion years old and that it was disturbed about 200 million years ago. So how does this affect us for the age of the Earth? Well, when we look at rocks on Earth and we're trying to find things that we can use for these dating systems, we want to find minerals that are going to be very resistant to change. We want to find minerals that are going to retain both the parent and the daughter from the time when they were formed so that we know we're getting um, accurate measurements of the ages of the material. And so when we look at the er oldest rocks that were formed on Earth, um, there's these 
all these kinds of rocks. And you can look at the differences in color. You can look at the different types of minerals that are here, ultramafic, mafic, intermediate, and felsic. And felsic rocks in particular are igneous rocks. This means they're completely molten. And then they, as they cool, they, they form these igneous rocks. These are rich in feldspar and quartz. Um, they're also enriched in silicon, oxygen, sodium, and potassium. That means that they're much more likely to form what are called silicates. And silicates, this high silica content, silicates are going to make it easier to form specific minerals like zircons. And zirconium silicates, zircons in particular, are extremely hard and almost entirely chemically inert, which means they don't react with other things. They're found in felsic formations, but if those rocks are eroded away, these zircons can also be carried by water and they can be deposited whole as grains into sedimentary rocks. These grains can show us evidence of many past events and the changes at the surface, they change more at the surface than they do at the core. So here's a picture, for instance, of a zircon that's been cut in, and that we've taken a section of, or that somebody has taken a section of. And you can see all these little rings in forming this zircon. These rings would represent different past events that changed it. And the center is going to be the least changed and the outside is going to be the most changed. Well, we can take these samples of zircons and we can put them on our instruments. This one called shrimp in particular accelerates a beam of ions, oxygen ions at the sample. Here's where that oxygen beam comes in. When that, those ions, when those accelerated ions hit the sample, they cause that sample to form other ions. Those other ions have charges. They can be accelerated through a mass separator that mass separator or mass spectrometer can then help us figure out what things are coming off, what ions are coming off. So we can use this to measure things like the lead and the uranium in the sample. And when we do that, when we look at zircons for that, we can get data, we can look at this data on one of these um, Concordia here, for instance. And the Acastanese, this is a type of granite, a felsic granite, um, it's in the Canadian Shield in the Northwest Territories. I'll show you a map in a second. And it consists of Archaean igneous and Nisic cores from ancient mountain chains. And the zircons are from Felsic Orthonese. And when we look at the zircons and we plot the data that we get from them for what all of their ages are based off of their uh, ratios, we see these lines here. These lines would be discordia. And they all intersect just over 4,000 million years. So 4,000 million years would be 4 billion years, okay? Um, you could follow these discordia along to wherever else they intersect on the, um, on the concordia, but, but these are showing us the important thing is the age, okay? And you can also look at differences between different types of zircons, but I'm not really gonna talk about that. This one's a little bit busier. What this shows us is that there's a number of zircons that were intact that were a little bit over 4,000 million years old or 4 billion years old, but that there was also a major event that affected these zircons in this collection that was about 3.6 billion years ago. So some of the original zircons survived, other ones completely melted and reformed, and they would have reformed 3.6 billion years ago. So putting this all together, the Acastanese actually yields three distinct ages. I've shown you two of the examples that were just over 4 billion years old. There's a third one that I didn't show here that came from the same paper, which was a little bit more than just over 4 billion years old. This circled zone here, this is where these samples came from in Canada. And these are dated then to the Hadean or Priscoan or Pre-Archaean. Um, eras, epochs, all that kind of stuff, um, which puts Earth's formation at least 4 billion years ago. Scientists believe that there was an intense meteoric bombardment of the young Earth that occurred between about 4.5 and, and 4 billion years ago. And so the surface of the Earth would have still been very molten, and there would not have been a whole lot of um, zircons that would have survived this time for us to be able to find. There are a few, a very small number of zircon grains that have been retained. 
Um, they were eroded into sedimentary rocks. They've actually been found in the Jack Hills of Australia, which is circled here at the bottom. And they're called detrital zircons because they are detritus. They've been eroded away and they've been deposited in sediments. And those zircons have been dated to about 4.4 billion years old. So if these are the oldest kinds of things that we can find on the earth that we know were formed on the earth, then maybe we need to look somewhere else to try to figure out what's the oldest the earth could possibly be. And for that, that means we have to look out of this world. And so we're looking at meteorites now. We're looking at things in our solar system that could have formed around the same time as the earth to try to put a ceiling on the age of the earth. So what's the uh, youngest material we see that's in the solar system that hasn't been subjected to um, continuous cycles of melting and reforming. And one of the neat things, this picture is here just for the patterns, these wittmann staten patterns or Thompson structures, they are nickel iron crystals that form in these meteorites. Here's a fragment of the Holtzinger meteorite that created Meteor Crater. This is one of the bigger craters in the United States. And when we look at these meteorites, it's theorized that they would have formed or cooled at the same time as the solar system or even prior to that. So some would be older, but the youngest of these should be pretty close to the age of the Earth. Most meteorites remain in space until recent falls on Earth, and those meteorites will not have been subjected to these cycles that would normally occur on the Earth in terms of the tectonic plates and stuff like that. 1953, Claire Cameron Patterson measured ratios of the lead isotopes in samples of the Canyon Diablo meteorite. This made the Behringer Crater in Arizona, um, and that was dated to 4.55 billion years old. And 2010 measurements of the calcium aluminum inclusions in the same meteorite gave a date that was about 4.57 billion years old. And so this kind of gives us the upper ceiling on the age of the Earth. So we believe the Earth has to be somewhere between four and about four and a half billion years old. And the accepted age of the Earth now is 4.54 plus or minus 0 0.05 billion years old. So there is an uncertainty here in the age of the Earth. The uncertainty in the age of the Earth is about 1% of the accepted age. And the uncertainty is about 50 million years in an age that we would say is uh, 4,540 million years old or 4.54 billion years. The potassium 40 that I showed on the other slide that was here with the calcium aluminum inclusions, the calcium aluminum inclusions would have a lot of calcium and they could contain calcium 40. Potassium 40 is radioactive, so we can also use that pair to date these rocks that's used for specific types of meteorites, maybe that don't have as much uranium and lead contained in them. And there are all kinds of other chronometers that we can use for dating of rocks. And um, whenever these systems match up well with the rocks that we're looking at, they give us really good ages. They all agree for what the age of the earth would be. Um, it would not be as accurate, as precise to use any of these systems with much longer half-lives because there wouldn't have been as much change in the amount of the daughter product. So we want to try to match the chronometer that we use to the age of the Earth. So the potassium and calcium would be the best match other than the uranium and lead um, system here, the uranium-238, the uranium-238 lead-206 which is almost exactly the same as what the age of the Earth is. So what this means actually is that about half of the uranium-238 that was present in the Earth when it was formed has decayed away. Um, I think this covers it pretty well. Uh, there's a lot of evidence for this being the age of the Earth. It's all based off of radioactive decay. Um, if you're gonna try and poke at this number, then you have to poke at the assumptions and how the samples are analyzed to determine things. You'd have to also really come up with a good explanation of, let's say you are trying to say the decay constant really isn't constant. You'd have to come up with a really good explanation of why the decay constant is not constant um, that would affect these ages of the earth. So I hope this is helpful. Um, with four and a half billion years for the earth's age, um, life has been around not that long on the surface of the earth but it has been around long enough 
where um, Darwin's theory of evolution with natural selection has had enough time to act to create the number of species that we know about on the earth. So if you have other questions, um, please feel free to let me know. I hope this is helpful for some of you and that some of you have a better idea now of how we know how old the earth is.